Thank you, everybody. Let me first start out by introducing our panel. It is, sorry, I have to take my glasses off. I can't see you if I'm going to see my text. Uh, that's just a way of things. Firstly, there's Aline, uh, who at the age of 18 left Islam and embarked on a journey of discovery, of discovering the meaning of life through a secular humanist perspective, which is, of course, close to my secular humanist heart. Uh, and on his YouTube channel, Secular Spirit, he deconstructs organized religion uh, and works to share the stories of ex-Muslims who have been silenced by fear. There is, secondly, uh, again, Gita Sagal, writer, journalist, filmmaker, and rights activist. Among many other things, she's a spokesperson for One Law for All, a founder of the Center for Secular Space, and she produced the film Women Leaving Islam for the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. You might be done that. There is Muhammad Hissam. Um, He's an Egyptian electronics engineer who appeared in a live Egyptian television talk show to speak about atheism. That led to threats uh, to his life in Egypt afterwards. Sadly. Then there is uh, my friend Khadija Khan, who I'm very happy to see back in Oslo under conditions less likely to freeze her to death. <laughs> Khadija is a Pakistani journalist and broadcaster based in the UK. She's an ardent advocate for secularism and criticizes the use of blasphemy laws as a tool to crack down on dissent. And finally, and there is, uh, and now I have mixed up my papers, Ibn Barak, a leading figure in Quranic criticism and author of 14 pioneering books on Islam and Quranic criticism, including the classic Why I'm Not Muslim, who I'm also happy to say is, is translated into Norwegian and published by our uh, Norwegian Humanist Association's publisher. Uh, he will uh, uh, give uh, the, the opening words here, but I'm going to take the liberty to keep the microphone for a couple of minutes more while I'm up here. Uh, firstly, as I work for the Norwegian Humanist Association, I have been tasked with giving you all uh, Greetings from our president, Krista Dubstalm, and General Secretary uh, Trum Engin, who sadly cannot be here, as they are in Singapore on uh, the General Assembly of the International Humanists. Um, I'm going to run for a little bit with a metaphor in the title here. A canary in a coal mine was an advanced warning system. Miners used to take caged canaries with them into the mines, and if there was methane or carbon monoxide present, the canary would die before they reached levels hazardous to humans, giving the miners an early warning and a chance to get away. As a system, it is rather cruel to canaries. So asking if ex-Muslims are canaries in the gold mine is a, is a question that should focus less on the cute canary aspect and more on the danger it was in and how to avoid it. But the question remains, if ex-Muslims are the canaries in the coal mine, what is the coal mine? What are they meant to give us a warning about and who are the miners? The coal mine in question is a setting of the metaphor, so I suppose that is wherever the ex-Muslim in question happens to be. And just to make sure I've asked Mariam, and she says that the danger is Islamism. And that should make the miners in danger whatever society the coal mine happens to represent. This gives us three questions. Firstly, what are the dangers to society from Islamism? Secondly, what are the dangers to ex-Muslims? And third, and possibly most important, at least for this debate, what are the warning signals these canaries have to give us the miners? <coughs> what is it that ex-Muslims have to tell our societies about the dangers of Islamism? And as we, the miners, are not really in a position to escape from the mines, how are we to deal with the dangers they warn us about? 
To discuss that, we have this panel, and we will open with giving the word to Ibn Varak, who I now know hates the metaphor of the canary in the coal mine and has a different one to present. <laughs> Yes, uh, when Mariam Namazi proposed this uh, metaphor to me, I, I wasn't sure what it really meant. Um, I am a, uh, if he's, I prefer another metaphor, which I'll give you at the end of, of, of my little introduction. Um, the idea, I think, is we've been warning, all of us here present have been warning the West, the countries in where we were living, we were living, about the dangers of, of Islam and Islamism, if you like, but uh, I don't make the distinction myself. Um, but it's not, it's not clear that, that our message has been un understood. I mean, I wrote my first book, Why I'm Not Muslim, in 1995, and the message still has not got through, it seems to me. <laughs> I, um, and one of the panelists here uh, said earlier, uh, we really have to repeat over and over and over again the same thing. It's, it's a bit, bit tedious, but that's the only way uh, the message will get through. So uh, I, I was, um, uh, I did some very quick research on the, the peasant situation, uh, particularly in, in, in Britain and in France. Um, uh, there was a recent book which came out uh, uh, by Etienne de Larcher, Au cœur de l'Islam de France, Trois ans d'infiltration dans 70 mosques. It's a journalist who went to 70 mosques and he talked to not just the imams but the, uh, the ordinary Muslims that, that he met. And he, he passed himself off as a convert, a newly converted Muslim, and he was eager to find out more about his religion. And his, his conclusions are pretty, pretty depressing. I mean, he says, uh, he found that the majority of the, uh, of the people that he talked to endorsed the Sharia, uh, they endorsed the punishment for adultery, they endorsed the, uh, they, they, they found women inferior to men. Uh, they didn't think that the women should be allowed to give testimonies in a court of law, uh, and so on. It was, it's, it's amazing. And then there's another journalist, uh, um, Guy Millier, uh, uh, who, who gives even more startling statistics about what the situation in, in France. Uh, he, he publicized a survey, a poll which was taken in the Le Journal de Dimanche, um, at the beginning of this year, uh, and, and the, the results are pretty, pretty depressing. Uh, the majority of the Muslims that interviewed uh, wanted um, Sharia, and they wanted uh, uh, Catholics to convert to, to Islam, they wanted the churches to be converted into mosques, and so on. It was a really depressing picture. So, uh, but the, the, the authorities are not helping at all. Um, that this is why uh, my, 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 I will change my metaphor to uh, we are in the, in the Titanic, which is, uh, has struck the, the iceberg, and all we can do is rearrange the deck chairs. So it's, just, uh, it's an inadequate response to a sinking ship. Um, so, uh, well, what are the solutions um, that we can leave to the, to the panel? To, I, I have a few ideas, but I will leave the pass it on to my colleagues. If I could have one microphone back, <laughs> it would make my job easier. I have uh, noted down some questions to start off here. Uh, I am going in the spirit of Eric before here to be a fairly strict, uh, uh, fairly strict uh, keeper of time. Uh, 
as there are so many interesting people here to listen to, we need to sort of restrict uh, how much time each of them uses, so everyone shall have a chance to give us their message. But I would like to start with Gita and return to the film about women leaving Islam. Um, what did the, that work, the work of that film, show you about the role of ex-Muslim women, especially in, uh, in the role of, of giving that this kind of warning we are talking about here? Hello. Um, I'm sorry you have me again so <laughs> quickly. It's all Mariam Namazi's fault. You can work a bit. <laughs> um, one of the things I want to say about the film is that the version that you, I hope you've seen it, if you haven't seen it, please go and watch it on YouTube, Women Leaving Islam, is that it, it was a second version of the film. Because we made an entire Karl, who's here, um, and Mariam had uh, interviewed, well, various people had done interviews, including Mariam and others. I was brought quite late into the project. We'd done an entire edit of amazing women who were talking about their lives, uh, coming from different countries, as in this room. Some of them were converts, like Western converts to Islam. Some of them had grown up in a Muslim um, country or in a Muslim family in the West. They came from diverse backgrounds. When it came to actually showing, them, we got consent forms from all of them, but when it came to actually sh uh, bringing the film out, we asked for consent again, because this is a very dangerous subject, as all of you know. Um, and none of them really wanted to be in the film anymore. It wasn't necessarily that they changed their views, but they didn't want to go public. And so we had to do a second film, uh, of which Zara Kay was part, and there may be other people uh, who were part of that film who are here. I know Halima is here, um, and to talk to them about it. They, but they said, they were already public. They had recited poems, they were creating content on Langrain, and so on. So we went with women who had made themselves public as ex-Muslims. And the warnings they were giving uh, were, in, in, I think in all their cases, where they come from very, very fundamentalist families. I don't think all Muslims are the same, or all Islam is the same. And if we move on to, you know, what are the answers? We were discussing secularism, laicite, uh, in the morning. They embraced that kind of thinking, that kind of politics, from their experiences of not only of Islam being oppressive to them as human beings, but as women. They had experiences of FGM, of trying to oppose and fight FGM, of hideous domestic violence in their families. Some of them had been preachers before. They had actually been proselytizers for their religion before they changed their minds. Um, and it was for that, the form of Islam that we've just been talking about, the one that says impose Sharia and so on. I think if you talk to Muslims across the world, not in the West, they've lived under these kind of systems. I don't think they want them in the mass. The people of Sudan are now locked in a terrible civil war by warlord, uh, warlords who won't accept what happened in Sudan, which was a secular revolution led by women, led by women against, you know, pushing for a civil state, pushing for a secular state. You know, I don't think the people of Iran want these mullahs anymore, and many, many other countries. So we have both versions going on. We have a, a, a horrific forms of Islam being promoted, propagated, and actually settling down in the minds of the people, especially identity, people looking for an identity in, the, in other countries. And we have millions of people unable to, to speak uh, who are actually fed up with this and hate the mullahs. Oh, was it lost us again? Hmm. Secondly, I, I have a question for Ali. Um, you use in YouTube. You're using sort of modern social media, modern uh, modern media to reach out to people all around the world. Uh, how do you see uh, media like that? What, what kind of uh, uh, options do they give us in spreading or give you in spreading that message? That um, and and what are uh, what are the benefits of using this kind of media in in, in that kind of work? 
excellent question. So what I would say is, like many people who've been on this panel and the previous panels, I am a journalist. I come from a journalistic background. <coughs> and one thing I found almost immediately when I started off in this field was that there's almost nothing about the ex-Muslim experience, the ex-Muslim perspective. I did discover Ali Razvi's book, The Atheist Muslim. I think he's here. I think I might have spotted him at some point. There he is in the back. Yeah, so that was one exception. And what I discovered was there was a real rarity. And what a lot of journalists here already know is there are gatekeepers in this profession. And there's a whole idea of freedom of expression and you know putting your story out there. But if the people who control, the gatekeepers who control access, mainstream media, the book publishers, if they're not interested, if they're not paying you, you can't make a living and you can't get access to the big audiences that they have. And so that's where social media comes in. So I actually wrote a book about my experiences, couldn't get it published, and I realized, why don't I just turn to social media? And the thing that's so powerful about social media is something we already know. There's the dark side where anyone can talk, anyone can, can share their opinion, but you can access people and reach people that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. So I started my YouTube channel three years ago, and I reached people, I look at the, you can look at all the countries that your stuff goes out to. I reached people with my ideas, every continent, maybe except Antarctica. Uh, and people messaged me, they contacted me, they, they contact me, and I realized that there's so many shared experiences, and a lot of people, they were thinking what I was thinking, they just didn't have a way to express it, and that's where the power of social media comes from. And it's really just the power of conveying ideas that I think a lot of people in the West, especially when they think about Islam, they don't, they don't realize is the issue with an organized religion like Islam. And that's how much it affects your life and how much it affects the way you treat people in the world and the way you just look at things. And so I would say, if there's anything else people can take from this, it's that if you can just share that perspective because I feel like I'm talking to people already sold because you're here. But if you share those questions that led you to leave religion or led you to question religion, and you put that out there, you might get people who object, obviously, but you'll reach people who maybe never thought about it that way before. And that's the most important thing you can do. And that's what I hope I'm doing and that I think everyone else is doing too. Thank you. That was perfect, young time. Mohammed. <laughs> I think perhaps uh, the most interesting thing about you is your own story. In this case, I am only in this case, I don't know you that well, Alice. we met three minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> but, but could you tell us a little bit about your experience from going on television that first time and, and, and how that shaped you and how that shaped where you are today? Um, yeah, <clears throat> I can say a little bit about that. Um, well, um, in my country, um, our um, minorities and many people are oppressed because of Islam. Um, if you trace um, the problems of my society, if you look at them closely in Egypt, you could trace them to Islam. Almost every problem we have, if you looked closely and analyzed it, you could find Islam playing a role or a major role in these problems. And um, and that created, and when I became an ex-Muslim, that created a lot of uh, oppression and, and pressure inside me. And I was, um, I was ready to uh, give my life uh, for a change. And I went in this TV show and I tried uh, and started to, um, advocate uh, for separation between mosque and state. I started to advocate uh, for being ex-Muslim does not mean that uh, you're immoral or that um, you are not no use anymore for the society as imams try to, fail, to brainwash people to think. And um, yeah, that has, that has changed my life in a way that I couldn't no longer um, safely and peacefully live in my country, and I had to leave. 
and uh, in between uh, uh, there was difficult things that happened. Um, yeah, in this term I am a sort of canary for the West. <laughs> Thank you. Khadija, I would like to move on to a subject that is close to our hearts here in the Nordic countries now, that is blasphemy, blasphemy laws. Norway uh, got rid of its blasphemy law in 2015, Denmark in 2016, and then last year they brought back something that looks a little like a blasphemy law which is a law against uh, defiling holy scriptures. Um, how do you see uh, the use of blasphemy laws, the demand for blasphemy laws, being used by, by Islamist groups around the world? Uh, how do we stand up to that kind of demands? Because we are seeing them, I think, in all, all Nordic countries, and in all countries who do not have these kind of laws. In Muslim majority countries, uh, when um, somebody is accused of apostasy or blasphemy, they are not given the option to choose between repentance and punishment. Uh, they are publicly executed, uh, or in worst cases, they are lynched by a violent mob. Well, we don't have uh, uh, blasphemy laws in the West, almost not, but still publicly denouncing uh, Islam in and of itself, a constitute a huge statement. Uh, it's not a crime to uh, denounce Islam in public here in the West, but even in the West, ex-Muslims and people who want to criticize religion, they face uh, social ostracism, they reprisals, and in some cases, violent attacks. Uh, and it also draws um, unabated criticism, uh, not only from religious zealots, but also uh, from politically correct liberals in the West. Um, it is a sad reality for many ex-Muslims here in the West uh, that they are often advised by the authorities and by some well-meaning uh, Western liberals uh, to keep low profile, uh, to keep quiet, not to offend fanatics, and never to complain about the threats and abuse you endure for your own safety. <coughs> As a result, many people, uh, like ex-Muslims, they have opted to live a life of anonymity. Um, I know personally people who have deactivated their social media accounts, they have covered their faces in public, and um, they live a life, you know, isolated life, you know, in, in, in Western democracies where we um, believe that we have all the freedoms and liberties that can honor human dignity. In, in modern age. Um, and I think the problem uh, with blasphemy laws that we see the urge to see those laws back into uh, you know, the equation, uh, the problem is that the, political, uh, the politically correct, net, uh, correct liberals, they ha have been unable to see the perils posed by the religious fundamentalism. I, mean, I know there is a history of Western society, they have fought battles, you know, just to put religion, um, you know, in its place out of political and social discourse. But uh, somehow when it comes to Islam, they have, uh, you know, adopted this uh, policy of appeasement and reconciliation. I, I, I have observed it, like there is an element of political correctness uh, under the guise of reconciliation has been infiltrated in secular democracies in the West, and uh, people, they are afraid of uh, being uh, called uh, racist. I think that's been used as an excuse uh, to just cover up their own, uh, I, would, I would say, inability to call out uh, the Islamism or, or the religious fundamentalism that we see ever growing in, in our societies. And the prize, he, these ex-Muslims are just those people, those brave people, who have the courage to, to break the shackles of religious orthodoxies and this ever-growing religious intolerance, this appeasement, this unhinged you know, political correctness, they have, it, it has pushed these brave people into oblivion. And this is my concern that 
many people who should be free out there living a normal life. We are not living a normal life. I was attacked in my workplace by my two female Muslim hijab wearing uh, co-workers. Uh, my name is Khadija, uh, and as it happened, uh, Prophet's first wife's name was Khadija. And uh, um, since I have uh, uh, denounced Islam and I don't wear hijab, so I don't have any right to be called Khadija and to be respected at all. To them, I'm an apostate, a blasphemer, uh, who needed to be punished. So whatever happened, it was traumatic, it was abusive, but it happened, and it happened here in the West. That is, the, I would see it as a tragedy. It didn't happen in Muslim majority country because there, as I said, you don't, you're not given an option to choose from, like you want to uh, repent or you want to be punished. It's just you are being, uh, you know, given sentence and there is no option for you. But here in the West, we claim to have liberty, freedom, free speech, and I feel like. If I say that ex-Muslims are not the counter is uh, in a coal mine, not only the counter is uh, in a coal mine who are warning you about the danger of Islamism and religious fundamentalism, uh, they are also, I would say, the soldiers who are fighting on the front lines to defend and protect the hard-earned liberties, freedom, free speech, tolerance, democracy, secularism here in the West that many of the Western have taken for granted. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I should, just, I should like to add that apart from being accused of uh, Islamophobia, uh, us ex-Muslims, I had one American journalist come to me and say, uh, well, you can no longer criticize Islam because you're out of it, you're out of the game. So I said, do you, you really have to be a fascist to criticize fascism? <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that. Yeah. Islam is not for you. It's, it's uh, been weaponized to uh, not only silence, but also smear uh, all critics of all shades of Islam. Uh, and uh, it's, it's being used as, as an excuse uh, to uh, delegitimize the concerns uh, ex-Muslims, their races. And uh, this is the problem that people who are pushing this one term into social political discourse, they can't see, I mean, they can see, but they don't want to acknowledge, you know, the danger this one term is posing uh, when it comes to, you know, free speech in the Western societies. You're touching upon one of the points on my list here which is uh, namely the use of Islamophobia, the weaponization of Islamophobia. But is there, is, there a legit, is there any legitimate use for a word like Islamophobia, or is it only a weapon being used against the West? It was coined to describe anti-Muslim bigotry, but uh, we see uh, the way uh, this term has been used, it's been uh, not only used against ex-Muslims or the dissenting voices within the Muslim community, it's been also used against anybody outside of the community who dare to question, uh, you know, religious orthodoxy, uh, in this case Islam. Uh, and, I mean, people who are educators and who are like very much uh, secular, very much uh, human rights defender, they have been accused of Islamophobia. Even talking about women's rights, it's, it's a kind of like, crime uh, now in the West. And I, I feel like the, the most tragic thing is that this smear doesn't only come from religious fanatics or Islamists. It comes from uh, the Western liberals a lot. They don't want to discuss Islam at all. They, they want us to be quiet and to, to live the lives we are living. I mean, they, in, in the name of respecting people's culture and religion, they are giving them a green card to treat their women, their vulnerable people, vulnerable section in their society the way they want. And we see the minorities within minorities, they are suffering, immensely suffering, and the people who claim to be the torchbearer of, of uh, human rights or, or you know, democracy or secularism, they, they seem to have turned a, a blind eye to the plight of these people. Uh, Gita, have, have, have you seen much of this kind of pushback against the film, against the women standing out, out there? 
Well, I was never in a in a physical screening, so I, 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 it's hard to answer that against the film. But on the question of Islamophobia, I was, it's widely used in India um, as, as, as a criticism against, as, as a substitute for saying something like anti-Muslim bigotry, which is a term that I would prefer, because that is not, uh, it's, it's not a figment of our imaginations. It actually exists. People are having their homes bulldozed, they're having their they're, you know, they're, they're, they're not given employment opportunities, they're not given housing, etc., etc. So Muslims are having a very hard time as a discriminated minority. And that's also true in some parts of, of Western countries. I don't think we can say this is all a figment of our imaginations, but we do see, and we've campaigned politically to stop the use of Islamophobia as a, as a definitional thing, as, you know, put in law. Uh, is being discussed in Britain for, among many other countries because it does become like a kind of blasphemy law. But I'd like to say another thing, that there, there's another definition that's circulating which became a big political issue in Britain and I'm sure has been in other countries as well, which is a definition of anti-Semitism, which is the, called the IHRA, I think the international, internationally, it, and it is, um, promoted as an internationally recognized definition, which conflates the hatred against Jews, which certainly exists, with hatred of Israel, or, you know, so therefore you have to defend Israel if you're not anti-Semitic. I think you have to separate these two things. And many Jews who have tried to separate them by producing alternative uh, definitions of anti-Semitism have been called self-hating Jews. Like, so the, the term self-hating Muslim is descended from the term self-hating Jews, for Jews who say, we're Jews, we're survivors of the Holocaust, or, or our parents or grandparents were, but we do not want genocide committed in our name. So that is one set of things that's happening. And I think there are very few fora in which people are willing to say that we oppose hatred against people, whoever they are, uh, but we will not defend a state unconditionally, nor will we defend a religion unconditionally. Um, and I think we really need to keep doing both those things. Mohammed, uh, your personal experience from uh, from the struggle you went through, uh, have you experienced that kind of accusations of like racism, Islamophobia, and so on, uh, either in Egypt or or in the West? Actually, not. <laughs> I don't remember if it happened. I just don't remember. And if it happened, I wouldn't take it seriously. Because the words, words are being sometimes misused, and when they are misused, then they don't mean anything. And uh, with Islamophobia, I mean, I think phobia is irrational fear, correct? If I'm afraid of Islam, that cannot be irrational, because it had to almost kill me or destroy my life or so. Um, yeah, certainly there are my people exist that have irrational fear, but to investigate that, it's not so easy to know that of its hate, it could be hate, it could be simply hate, you know? Not irrational fear, so yeah, I think there is a problem with using words and the meaning of these words. But I don't remember that I've, called, I've been called racist for criticizing Islam, I just, I don't think it happened to me. Uh, Ali, um, YouTube. YouTube has comment sections. <laughs> comment sections are, as we all know, a um, everlasting gift that keeps on giving goodness and niceness and all that stuff. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, what are your experiences with, with the comments? Are you experiencing the kind of things that Khadija are talking about there? A little bit, yes. So uh, I'm not a fan of Joe Rogan. Uh, <laughs> But he did give one good piece of advice to YouTubers, don't read your own comments. And of course I violated that rule many, many, many times. And so what's so interesting about working in that space is that everyone seems to have an idea of why I'm doing this and what I'm thinking and what I actually believe. And the thing that really stood out to me is they don't focus on the arguments you make, they don't focus on the points, the criticisms of Islam, they focus on you. Uh, so accusations I get regularly are, 
uh, fake Muslim, never was a Muslim, uh, he's being paid by, I don't know, whoever it happens to be uh, to just push this agenda, or I'm just trying to make money to get famous. Believe me, there's easier ways to make money than <laughs> criticizing Islam on YouTube. <laughs> really, <laughs> a lot more easier ideas. But here's the thing I wanted to mention here. So, so I'm a man criticizing Islam, and I get a lot of stuff uh, attacking my intelligence, my integrity, but that's nothing compared to what women who are in my space on YouTube, on Instagram, on TikTok, ex-Muslim women who criticize Islam, what they get is a whole other level, and I think that's revealing in of itself. Death threats, uh, threats of abuse, assault, and uh, threats to expose them, to stalk them, to track them down. And there's several women here who have dealt with this and talked about it. Uh, I do want to call out a name. Uh, Zara Kay was one of the first people to support me. I can't see Zara right now. But Zara knows this very well. And I think what it's so revealing about it is that when Islam is attacked by women, Muslims know that they're vulnerable on that point because you just have to look at the, at the Quran, at the Hadith, to look at the Prophet Muhammad's story to know that it's problematic when it comes to women. And when you criticize people and you hit them at the point where they're most vulnerable, they're gonna lash out in the most violent, aggressive way possible. Yeah, so, I mean, that's an excellent answer to the question that was posed to me. It's not so much the film, but the women in the film that have faced exactly that, exactly that. We have 21 minutes to go, but that includes a bit of art and questions. Uh, so I think uh, we should possibly try to move towards the idea of solutions. Are there solutions? Uh, in Ladakh, you don't so sound very hopeful. Uh, but you have, then again, taken an enormous amount of notes during, the, during the, uh, this conversation. Uh, do you have any concepts of things we could do? except from arranging the lectures? Um, yes. Well, uh, I have taken, um, uh, in my subsequent books after Why I'm Not a Muslim, I, had, I did a series of books on Quranic criticism, on the search for the historical Muhammad, uh, origins of the Quran, I'm sorry, uh, what the Quran really says and so on. So. I think that the way to go is, is to, to present the historical critical examination of Islam to a larger public. People just don't know the real stories of, of what really happened in the origins of Islam. Um, that, that's, uh, to me, that would be the best, best solution, to, to make this research available to as many people as possible. And that's what I'm trying to do with all my and more popularizations of the origins of the Quran and so on. I think we'll just keep moving the word down the line here uh, and, and to try to focus on the solution aspect. Um, I believe that uh, people uh, who try to snub disagreements and opposing views or try to remove them from the discussion, eventually they find themselves eliminating dissent in all of its uh, manifestation. So we all need to understand this one thing, that once we have compromised our right to free speech in order to appease certain minorities or certain uh, section of the minorities, there we have given up all our right uh, to be a free person. And I want to say, especially to the ex-Muslim women, uh, that um, I know it's hard I know it takes toll on our mental and physical health. I know it disrupts our day-to-day -day activities. <coughs> but we don't have an option to take a step back. In fact, we don't want to retreat uh, because we have burned the boats. And we are so resolved to keep moving forward and fighting against these extreme ideologies that we don't see any way back from that point. And Probably we're not going to see victory in our lifetime, but we know that we are part of a movement that is paving the way for the victory to come and embrace us, even when we are not there. In our struggle, our spirit is here to stay, to guide generations after generations to continue fighting against religious fundamentalism.
For me, the solution is one simple word, education. I think education is really the way to just change our entire world's position, not just on Islam, but on the dogmas, the oppressions of organized religion. And what I mean by that is, to go back to what I was saying earlier, it's about asking the right questions and showing different perspectives. So if you watch the clip of Muhammad and his interview, they barely let him even talk. It wasn't even an interview. That's intended to control you because they know that Egyptian people, they're watching that talk show. They're not watching anything else, so they don't have access to another perspective. And that's where, again, social media can come in to show people and educate people on different perspectives. So uh, when I was growing up, let's say early 2000s, I was still Muslim, and I remember being very homophobic. I just thought uh, two men kissing each other was disgusting, an abomination. And what changed my mind on that was just learning another perspective, and it was through a movie actually, Brokeback Mountain. Uh, I watched it, and I remember being judged by my friends at the time. I was living in the Middle East, being judged that I was watching it. But what was so revealing about it was, it made me think about how, why do I hate uh, homosexuality? Why do I find it to be an abomination? And I realized I didn't have an answer. I didn't have an answer to that question. And sometimes it takes asking that question, learning that perspective, and that's education, really, in a nutshell. So I think it really starts from there. Yeah, I think the solution uh, can happen on uh, more than one front. Um, education is really important, and especially from my point of view, education of children. So we could um, invest a little bit in this area. We could introduce philosophy more, um, critical thinking. Um, there are many interesting philosophical arguments and logical arguments that it doesn't have to be direct, it doesn't have to be um, directly against religion, but it could just teach children, especially Muslim children, Middle Eastern children, how to think critically. And um, and then that, that would be some sort of like the seeds and that could grow in, in time. Another aspect would be um, new Islam. Um, the problem is that if you read the Quran, you find a lot of violence in Quran, you find a lot of problematic things that it's really hard to solve. Um, and I think we need a new Islam. For that to happen, we would need an intellectual war against uh, inside the Islamic community political will, um, so it should be internationally organized. Um, I think the financial resources for that exist. Uh, billions and billions uh, are uh, invested in the Middle East on uh, is Islamic institutions. So we could invest in a new Islam. Um, uh, an example, um, in the beginning of Islam, um, the, the Islam was peaceful, partially. In Mecca, and afterwards, when Islam starts to be stronger, then it started to get really, really violent. One could make an argument similar to the Christian argument, like, yeah, the Prophet uh, fought wars and suffered in these wars to free us, and now we have to live in peace, for example, and uh, follow the early Islam, and he. He's, he died for our sins, then he fought wars for our sins. So, as some sort of, like, there could be games that could be done. It's intellectually not impossible to have, to have that. We just have to finance it, and we have the will for it. Um, the work of ex-Muslims is also very, very important, like applying pressure from outside it. And to avoid that identity politics trap, it's not only ex-Muslim, also um, people who were never Muslims and uh, interested, they could also invest in that. Criticizing Islam is very important. And uh, it works. It changed people's mind. The work of Ali it changes people's minds. And um, that should also be uh, supported and also uh, financially supported. Um, so that it works. If we compare 
the amount of money that goes to religious institution in comparison to amount of money that goes to secular institutions that works on the problem of Islam. That's, uh, the Islamic can receives really, really much more, and for that reason, it dominates also. Um, yeah, so to summarize that really fast education, especially with the children, so smartly introduced logical and philosophical ideas that makes people think straight. Um, yeah, and political pressure and money uh, to change Islam from the inside and also apply pressure from the outside to change Islam. So that would be how I see the situation. <laughs> Islam is not a static entity. I mean, a lot of it has been getting worse over the over the years. That's what we call Islamic fundamentalism. Or, you know, I've, I've been part of movements that define fundamentalisms as far right movements that use a specific version of religion to, uh, you know, and, and impose that on others. So um, it's there. You know, there are forms of Islam in which women dance. I mean, there's a Pakistani dancer. Many of you will be familiar with her name. Maybe Shima Kirmani. She's not only a dancer who stood up against the military regime and the Islamicization of Pakistan in many, many ways, in many social ways, but she danced in a space of a shrine which was attacked by jihadi terrorists, a Muslim shrine that was attacked by jihadi terrorists, uh, you know, as her answer to their terrorism. So, you know, there are many kinds of Islam. The official kinds of reforming movements have been tried and massively subsidized and promoted by Western aid age organizations and things like that. And what they do is they promote fundamentalist Islam in the end. So they've actually been a disaster to all of us. Um, and a disaster to believing Muslims who are not fundamentalists because they actually promote uh, that, you know, that if you're not part of that particular uh, women's reform movement and don't believe in that theology, then you're more outside it. So actually, Mariam as an ex-Muslim has been even more of a platform to my Muslim feminist friends, who, as, as my friend Yasmin Rahman, who's British, says, I'm a Muslim and I'm a feminist. I'm not a feminist Muslim. To her, her Islam is private, and her feminism is a universalist feminism that doesn't have, is not bounded and hedged by religion. So my answer is that we need to be part of much larger movements, which are not, they're not, they're not, this is not a utopian thought. There are movements going on now. There's a huge movement fighting the Taliban in, in not only, obviously, there are people fighting the Taliban as much as they can, raising their voices in Afghanistan, but on the borders of Pakistan, uh, <clears throat> which is inspired by historic movements for peace, inspired by a man who was a Muslim, who believed in educated women, and who took the message of the Quran to be, uh, and I'll pronounce it differently from you, was Sabha, uh, patience. You know, so he was a non, he took non-violence from the Quran and followed Gandhi, but he was a mass leader. And now there are thousands upon thousands of Pakistanis saying we don't want the mullahs, we don't want the military, we don't want to be ruled like a backward tribal movement, we want civil rights, we want full civil rights for ourselves. Now, they're not ex-Muslims. They would probably largely define themselves as Muslims. But they are part of that civil rights movement, which, which, which is also pointing out the government's policies that has um, promoted the Taliban from within and helped them to get to power in Afghanistan and said, we don't want these people on us. So that's just one example of a secular movement that is actually dealing with some of the worst forms of fundamentalism and state violence at the, sa at the same time. And I think we need to support and encourage these movements and to be part of those movements as much as we can. A couple of you have asked for the, for the word here now, but I think we should first take just a little round of questions from the room, and then you can have uh, an, a minute for a uh, final remark afterwards, because we have just eight minutes left. Uh, there are a lot of hands in the air. Um, I have no idea about who was first, and I'm halfway blinded here anyway. So, um, start, start from the back. Yeah, start in the back, move forward, keep it very short. You're going to say something. Be quiet. Maybe 
Hello everyone, wonderful experience being here. Um, I'd just like to, with just a couple of minutes, maybe one minute. No, you don't have a minute, you have half a minute. Uh, it's ten seconds then. I'm interested in the illiterate, the political illiter illiter illiteracy of the UK, 90%. And with uh, the thought that a 30 year old man, is he mature if he believes in God? So, uh, I had a question actually, Aleem. You know, you mentioned Brokeback Mountain, and that made me think of I was very homophobic when I was young, and what changed it for me was Philadelphia, the movie with, with Tom Hanks. So, I guess one of my questions is. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking about education and understanding history, but what about the role of fiction and storytelling, which I think can be really powerful, um, I mean, from Orwell to you know, whatever you have now. Uh, I read all these op-eds on uh, you know, gay rights and gay marriage and everything, but eventually it was Philadelphia, the movie, that changed my mind. And in your case, it was Book I So what, what do you think about just the power of fiction and storytelling as something to bring in? Um, and art in general. I think it's incredibly powerful, and that's why religious authoritarian states censor things like books and movies. So the reason I didn't see Philadelphia was because I was living in the UAE, uh, Dubai specifically, and they wouldn't show that movie in the UAE. And the way I saw Brokeback Mountain eventually was, uh, I hope there's no police are here. I pirated it. I, I torrented it. So, so that's like one plus of, of piracy. You can actually access things that you wouldn't normally be able to. Uh, so I think it's really powerful because uh, first and foremost, uh, I see myself as a writer, storyteller. And what really strikes me about storytelling is it teaches us empathy. It teaches us to be in someone else's shoes, to learn someone else's perspective and I think that's really the key in understanding other people and not demonizing them which is something that a lot of us in the world are obsessed with doing so for example I don't demonize Muslims I don't hate Muslims I see them as uh, victims as well so the thing that's so so important about that is once we see each other in that way as other human beings we can actually bridge our differences, which sounds like a politician's empty line, but I actually think it's true. We have less, less than five minutes to go, so we will have to be very, very... It's okay for me, five minutes, thank you. <laughs> now, uh, from the fiction to reality, as may all of, uh, some of you know, uh, Bertrand Russell has a very f famous uh, uh, saying, says that if we didn't have a sentence as God has said, we, we could have Galileo or, Co or, or, or Copernic thousand years ago. Imagine if we had an AI thousand years ago. But my, my, my take in this, in the solution was that I think this naivety or political naivety in, 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 in West that uh, uh, identify religion as a, as a part of identity to the, to the human. And uh, here in Norway as well, it's, like, uh, it's acceptable that the, that the kids inherit their religion. And I think with that, you, it doesn't matter how, many, how, how much time you use to educate the, the, let's see, the, the, the parents. The children is already pushed to the wrong track. It takes a long time to come back and say, OK, why I pushed it to that corner? Who said that I should inherit the religion? I think in, 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 some, in some sense, we should, as a both activists or political activists, to just work again this that no no kids actually inherit religion or it's not part of your let's see genetic you you don't have a religion you know what i mean and i think that's a part of, that that's a problem with wisdom that it's it, 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 it is now practiced daily and that's a problem in, in some let's see muslim majority country that's another case but in europe come on we have three minutes to go, and I think we will simply have to skip the rest of the questions and uh, have the, some completing remarks from the panel here. Uh, I would say I, I would like to say something about you know the Western uh, peoples, you know, 
obsession with bringing restrictions on, on free speech. Um, they are doing so in terms of uh, protecting uh, people's sensibility. So I would like to uh, once again draw the line between people and the ideas. Uh, people like me, I have seen like in the Axis Muslim movement, largely people, they try their best to draw this distinction and try to maintain that distinction between the, during the discussion that we uh, don't have to demonize people in order to criticize ideas. People have right, ideas don't. And this line has been blurred, again I would say, not by the Islamists, not by the religious fundamentalists, but also some well-meaning, you know, Western liberal people who believe that uh, by shutting down, uh, shutting down the criticism on Islam, they could protect Muslims from bigotry. And I think this is also a form of bigotry if they think so, because Muslims as people, they have their dignity, they have their right to be respected. The idea, the set of ideas, which is Islam, has no right to be protected or you know, protected from any criticism that comes towards it. So I think we need to draw this, dis this distinction and try to maintain it. And then I don't think so that we can any way promote bigotry against people while we are just doing it. Um, I, I wrote uh, this huge book, uh, has about 700 pages or something. It's called Leaving the A Love Delusion Behind. Perhaps some of you got copies of that at the last uh, conference in, in Cologne. But there was a moral necessity to, for me to write this, uh, this book on atheism and Islam, just to, just to show uh, the, the Islamic world that atheism is not alien to Islamic civilization, that uh, it's not something foreign imported from, from the infidel West, that there were uh, actually uh, all sorts of uh, um, doubters, uh, uh, agnostics, uh, people who question, uh, you know, from uh, Ibn Rawundi, Ibn Warak, uh, uh, Ibn Razi, and so on. So uh, I think this, this, if incidentally, if anybody wants a, a copy of this book, they should leave their address with me, and I'll try to get my publisher to send you a copy. Thank you. Good the rest of the panel live with that being the concluding remarks because then we are five seconds over time and thank you all for your work.